Oh, welcome to St. Andrew's United Church in Edmonton, Alberta for Sunday, September 6th, uh, Labor Day weekend, long weekend in September. And uh, big weekend here for us at St. Andrew's is the Edmonton Symphony um, is going to be performing on our lawn this afternoon at 1.30. And uh, with any luck, we'll be able to live stream that as well, so you'll be able to see what the outside of the church looks like once again, as members of the Edmonton Symphony uh, Brass String and Wind Quartet play for uh, about an hour on our lawn. We're quite excited to welcome them and to welcome the neighborhood onto our lawn as well. Uh, this Sunday, uh, we're pursuing stories in the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, this is a story um, it just sounds like really good advice on how to get along and, and how to be in community. Uh, it's a story, though, that also is a pretty uh, subversive critique of many of the assumptions that many of us, both inside the church and without it, hold about how power is to be utilized and exercised. We're glad that you're here. Um, I hope you find this a uh, transformative and informative time. Chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, 
If two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by the Holy One in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. and as a candidate for orders uh, within the Society of Jesus, uh, the Jesuits. Um, the book is called Ours because that's how the Jesuits refer to each other, as in, he's one of ours, uh, not one of theirs. And uh, he writes with uh, a poignant and uh, many times a reverential uh, look at his time in the order uh, with all its foibles. Um, one of the stories he tells is about the spiritual discipline that the Jesuits practiced called admonition. And uh, it was a time in which the uh, novitiates were paired up with each other and they had to admonish each other for faults or flaws that they had seen in the other's character in the past week. Um, now you will know that probably the worst way to uh, get along in a community is to point out somebody's flaws. And so one of the techniques that the novitiates found uh, to get around this was to kind of offer each other backhanded compliments uh, under the guise of admonition. So they might say, you know, brother, I, I think you're praying far too hard for your own uh, well-being. Why, why don't you back it off a little? Or, you know, I saw that the kitchen floor that you were scrubbing was, uh, was clean within half an hour. I don't know whether you really need to spend an hour on the floor. Um, and everybody got along just fine with that. Until one day, E. e. Peters was well and truly admonished. Uh, he'd been asked to preach the homily in the weekly liturgy, a uh, great honor. And so he uh, applied himself with vigor. And uh, when the time came to preach, he was, uh, in his own estimation, brilliant and uh, had wonderful theology and great examples. and. Uh, thought it had been a great success and was even thinking that perhaps he had a career, a career before him as a preacher. Until admonition came the next day and the novitiate that he was paired with kind of gave him a quizzical look and said, Brother, I don't understand how it is that you can say all those wonderful things when you're not like that at all. And E.E. E. Peters said that he was well and truly admonished. Jesus seems to be offering uh, an example uh, or a case study of admonishment within a community and how to ensure that the community maintains its integrity by um, calling out people um, for their faults, flaws, and sins. Um, and it sounds relatively straightforward, uh, but you'll know from your own experience that uh, it's not always as easy as Jesus would make it out to be. And there was a story uh, not that long ago about a biblically focused congregation that tried to do exactly that with one of its members who had they seen committing some sin, undisclosed. So they went and uh, uh, confronted the person and then brought witnesses and when the person still wouldn't admit it, uh, they brought it before the whole church, at which point the accused person sued them for defamation and libel and actually won. And so a story like that is a reminder, uh, if it's a reminder of anything, it's a reminder of how 
important context is. And uh, what is true in one context may not necessarily work in another. Um, one of the things that often gets overlooked too is that really rather than just being good advice that Jesus is offering to the community is that this uh, really is a critique of power uh, and of religion um, of the day in which uh, Jesus is doing his ministry. Um, and it's a critique of the power of the emperor uh, and emperor worship and the religion that goes with that. In first century Galilee, in which uh, Jesus is ministering, uh, power comes through the emperor, but the power of the emperor comes through the gods. And uh, the emperor is the incarnation um, of that godlike power. And uh, the emperor goes by many names son of God, savior of the world, uh, the prince of peace. Uh, but it's peace that comes through a very specific program um, of violence and suppression and oppression. And uh, the peace that the emperor brings um, is a peace that uh, really is based on violence, uh, ritual institutionalized violence. And while there may be peace, it never lasts because people um, resent the uh, authority under which they live and are constantly in a state of rebellion. And the area of the Galilee in which Jesus is, is one of the most rebellious areas of the whole Roman Empire. And lots and lots of Roman resources are put in there to keep the peace and bring quiet to the provinces. Um, and here Jesus seems to be offering a different understanding um, of how peace uh, can come about. Uh, not through violence and not through oppression, but through the possibility of reconciliation, the possibility of coming to an understanding of the hurt and the damage that has been done through conversation and through dialogue. And um, he's also offering the community a sense that Really, this is the power of God, regardless of the power that the emperor seems to have uh, with all the institutional trappings and armies and violence at his disposal. And so when Jesus is saying what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven and what you bind will be bound, he's really saying that that is the power that the community has. Um, the community has the power to reconcile, the community has the power to heal, and it has nothing at all to do with violence uh, or oppression. And uh, we might think, well, those again are great words and, and great platitudes, but we, we know it often doesn't happen that way. And oftentimes, especially within communities or within families or within congregations, people uh, when they are hurt deeply, uh, won't try to reconcile, but will leave uh, and take that pain with them. Um, sometimes spread it around, sometimes never let anybody know uh, what the source of the discord is. And yet Jesus, uh, or whoever is writing this gospel, offers the possibility that reconciliation can happen uh, when people take that power um, unto themselves. Um, there's a Buddhist practitioner by the name of Sharon Salzberg, and she tells a story um, about a friend of hers by the name of Marjorie. Um, and it's a perfect example of the kind of power that Jesus is suggesting that the community has to heal and to reconcile, not necessarily to come to a happy ending. Uh, in which everybody is back to the way things were. Because oftentimes the growth that happens through that process of reconciliation will lead people on different paths. And uh, she tells the story of her friend Marjorie, whose um, daughter um, had a very difficult time as a teenager. Uh, she uh, 
had attempted suicide, been rushed to hospital, then have been placed in a psychiatric institution. And Marjorie had a, a longtime friend, a close confidant, had been an important person to Marjorie's children. Um, but she wrote Marjorie a letter saying that she felt that she was to blame for her daughter's uh, difficulties. And she criticized her child rearing, her performance at her job, her friendship skills, everything about her. And, uh, and at that moment when this woman deserved every kindness in the world, her friend only deepened her pain. And after receiving the letter, she and her friend didn't speak for years. And years later, when her daughter was doing much better and doing well in college, the friend who had heard her emailed her asking to reconcile. And Marjorie was still so angry that she couldn't be moved by the sincere request that was before her, furious that her friend had asked, in fact, for reconciliation. And, uh, but gradually she thought of how close her friend had been to her and her daughter. Um, she thought of all the special times that they'd shared together. Um, she thought of all the times that uh, her friend had, who had no uh, children of her own, had experienced her daughter's crisis almost as profoundly as Marjorie herself had. And as she allowed more and more space for the fullness of this event to unfold in her mind, she felt less and less ill will toward her friend. She understood that she could wish her friend well and hope that she could prosper. And so she wrote her a long letter back and ended it with, even though I forgive you completely and hold no bad feelings for you, and I wish you well, forgiveness leaves us both free to move on. And Sharon Salzberg writes that this is the freedom that forgiveness brings, the ability to move on without bitterness. Uh, Marjorie no longer had to get caught in the grip of this painful story and all the ways it caused her despair. She says, forgiveness is a way of loosening the grip of fixation. But I've seen over and over again that it's a process. It's not a decision. And it doesn't come about by the force of will. We may decide after exploring forgiveness that we, like Marjorie, don't want a continuing relationship with that person. For some, forgiving and understanding the relationship may be over, may be a viable path. People can really hurt each other. And there's no need to think, well, I've got to get over this in order that you can be my best friend again. We can find a way to forgive and to free our hearts. We are saying that life is bigger and that we are bigger and we are stronger than the hurt and the feelings around us. And in this way, forgiveness can be bittersweet because it contains the sweetness of the release of a memory that has caused suffering. And it's also a poignant recognition that relationships shift so much in the course of our lives, that perhaps we cannot reclaim the way that we were to one another. But whatever decision we come to about action in daily life, in the end, forgiveness is a path to peace and a powerful and important component of love. And so when Jesus is talking about reconciliation and the need uh, for a community to be reconciling, it's not to cover up the hurt and the pain that individuals cause each other or the cultures cause one another. It is to come to a deep understanding of the power that each have and the power that each has to choose its own future and its own way forward, free of the bondage of hurt and regret and desire for revenge. And so truly, as Jesus tells his disciples that what they bind and what they loosed on earth will be bound and loosed in heaven, truly too, through our willingness to undertake the hard work of reconciliation, wherever we may find it is needed. 
we too will find that we are loosening ourselves for a new future that is full of promise, full of possibility, and full of the fullness of life, of the peace that is promised to each one of us. And so for this day, this story, and the wisdom it contains, thanks be to God. Amen. Sunday, at the beginning of a new season, remembering the labors of those who have gone before us, remembering the labors of those on whom our lives depend, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this season of new beginnings, for the possibilities that it contains. We give you thanks for those who plan for the health and the safety of those for whom they care. We give you thanks for the possibilities of new knowledge that await us all, not only in the knowledge of heart and mind, but of spirit, and the ways that we are continually learning how to be a human community. We give you thanks for this shortening season, for the harvest that will soon be upon us, for the bounty of field and farm. We give you thanks for those who bring the food to our table. And we give you thanks for those who ask why there are those who do not have food. We remember those who are sick, and we remember those who are grieving. We remember those who feel isolated and alone, and who fear the coming winter and darkness. And we remember in our own depths of being that it is your light that guides us, and it is your presence that enfolds us, even in the darkness of winter. As we prepare to go into a new week, we ask that your spirit would be the spirit that goes with us, leading us forward, offering us new ways of being in community. And now, O oh God, we offer you the silent prayers of our hearts and of our minds.
into the world with a daring and a tender love and go in peace. The world is waiting. And whatever you do, do it for love in the name of Jesus who is with us on the way. And now may the grace of Jesus the Christ, the love of God and the communion and the compassion of the Holy Spirit be among us this day and forever. Amen.